Hi everyone, welcome to a show about our fight against uh, COVID and who are all the different warriors we have all over the world, uh, different types of people. Uh, so far, you know, this all started uh, because of uh, uh, Dr. Vishal, who was on our show, and we are all part of an advisory group uh, for COVID in the state of Karnataka. Um, so we've invited people from all over the world to talk to us about how different people are dealing with COVID. We had someone from New York and someone from uh, uh, Latin America and all over the place uh, to talk to us. Uh, today we have a uh, very interesting uh, guest and uh, our guest is from Kerala Trivandrum so that's why I'm wearing a Kerala color off-white uh, sari to, to honor his presence here. Um, so our uh, speaker is someone who has uh, uh, taken a very new, um, uh, what do you call, a field, which is palliative care. A lot of times when we think of palliative, palliative care, uh, we think of uh, somebody who is dying and how to manage the death, etc. But really, it's about uh, managing symptoms, you know, like when you have a, 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 you know, any kind of a disease, when you have a problem, you have to live with that problem, be it that you're going to die or be it that you have terminal illness or be it whatever. How do you manage the pain? How do you manage the situation emotionally, physically, in every possible way? It's an emerging science, very much needed. And uh, our uh, guest, Dr. Rajgopal, is someone who has dedicated his life to it. And I met him through my friend Nandita Lakshmanan, who highly recommended him. And after my team met him, they said, how come he did, he wasn't in our lives before? Uh, you know, so let's meet. Hi, Dr. Rajgopal. Hey, Namaste. Namaste, how are you? Very good, thank you very much. I was telling everybody that uh, I w I'm wearing Kerala colors today, off-white, because you are in uh, Trivandrum, so to honor uh, you being here, I'm I'm trying to look like a person from Kerala as much as possible. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, you know, one of the things is that I wanted you to tell us a little bit about palliative care because I was just giving a very brief introduction. A lot of times when we think of palliative care, we think of you know how to deal with death you know somebody but it's really a lot more than that it's about how to deal with living uh, you know how do you manage the pain how do you manage the symptoms how do you manage life uh, in more ways than one but i'd love to hear from you as to how do you define palliative care and also tell us how you got into it lakshmi thank you very much i think you have said it already it is more about life than death. So, in answer to your question, I can say it in a very short sentence. Palliative care is treatment of serious health-related suffering. Serious health-related suffering. Whatever mm -hmm. the disease, if there is a serious health issue that causes suffering, we mm -hmm. step in there. So, that mm -hmm. understanding then can go hand in hand with disease treatment. Mm -hmm. Somebody with, yeah. uh, uh, for example, cancer, it's not only cancer, for example, with cancer, their time of one, one point of great emotional upset is when they are mm. told they have cancer. At yeah. that time, their emotional status needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. If they are already in pain, that needs to be treated. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. it's about symptoms, as you said, but also mm -hmm. the emotional, social and spiritual issues that go together. So we mm -hmm. treat the person as a person, not as mm -hmm. a container of diseases. Mm -hmm. You treat the person and not only the disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, so may bring up an issue, then 
uh, can the palliative care doctor also treat the disease? No. Actually, it's about both going hand in hand. Mm. Yeah. If every doctor understands the basics of palliative mm -hmm. care, mm -hmm. then that person is using the palliative approach in all treatment. But if mm -hmm. there is a difficult pain situation, if there is a communication issue that that busy doctor cannot handle, then be stuck. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So also tell us the, you know, I want to welcome a lot of the people who have joined. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Anjanelu is here, is from Hyderabad. Nandita, who introduced us to you, she's online as well, uh, listening to us. And uh, you're Sirisha. We have a lot of people who joined. A lot of my team is here as well. So welcome, everybody. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how did you get into this? There's a story behind it. So how did you get into palliative care? Well, I have seen a lot of suffering around me from that time I was a medical student in my village mm -hmm. in the hospital. And uh, the pain was never addressed. Mm -hmm. Disease was treated. Pain was ignored. There was mm -hmm. such a lot of suffering. And mm -hmm. when I got the opportunity, I started mm -hmm. treating people for pain. Actually, mm -hmm. that's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a little too simple to attract technology-oriented profession. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I started treating people's pain, and uh, those people taught me that pain is not their only problem. They are not mm -hmm. only made of nerves and pain. They are people with major physical, social, and emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And in a search for an answer, I came across palliative care, which was something that already had existed for 20 years prior to that mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also started doing it from that point. Mm -hmm. And once I started it, a lot of people came forward to join me. Uh, mm -hmm. The media was very supportive. The public was very supportive and mm -hmm. it just ran away with us. So um, one of the things, I mean, obviously this show is about COVID and what's happening here, etc. And um, you're in Kerala and Kerala dealt with it in a very different way, in a very fast way. I mean, it was one of the highest and it's come down uh, now, etc. So tell me a little bit about how have you cooperated with the government or how does palliative care feature into COVID? Because obviously it's about pain management. It's about managing a situation, etc. So in some ways there is a lot of connection. So tell us how you and your institution gotten involved in COVID-19 and how you're cooperating with the government. Uh, so our involvement mm -hmm. has been not only to treat, not only to manage COVID, but also to manage the aftermath of the lockdown. Mm. Actually, so far in Kerala, because it was so successful in uh, combating COVID, mm -hmm. the little suffering so far has been because of the lockdown. People deprived of their routine hospital, people deprived of their routine medicines. Now, mm -hmm. Kerala is one place who dealt with that as efficiently as possible. But as mm -hmm. efficiently as possible was not really good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, there were people who couldn't move out of the house to go to the hospital and collect their medicines for diabetes or hypertension or even mm -hmm. from many mm -hmm. palliative Are we having a little bit of a trouble with... Uh, um doctor's uh, internet, he'll come back. Uh, and it is very interesting how what they're doing in Kerala is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of a uh, somebody who might be sick or whatever, when they're on a ventilator or whatever, but it's actually dealing with the pain and also emotional uh, pain because a lot of the senior citizens are at home 
and uh, they can go out they can do things so a lot of the times it's about managing uh, aging population who's single who's at home or it could also be migrants you know there is uh, there's a lot of people who come from all over the world uh, who are there you know who, are, who may be working there how do you deal with the migrant population so they have since in palliative care they know how to hi uh, hi doctor so we just talk, just talking a little bit about uh, that you're working with a lot of the elderly who are at home alone or could be migrant workers etc so tell us a little bit about what you're doing with them so once uh, the lockdown came mm mm-hmm. uh, we found that a lot of people I mean, we were already in trivandrum and the suburbs mm-hmm. we were treating on 350 patients they mm-hmm. needed continuous care mm-hmm. i mean five teams every would go out and make home visits mm-hmm. then we found that a lot more people now needed care because mm-hmm. the system was not was uh, fragmented Uh, so what we did was to start seeing anybody who needed uh, care so we added on a lot more patients that meant that we couldn't handle it with whatever resources we had at that time we mm-hmm. asked for more mm-hmm. resources yeah we when I mean, kerala government decided that volunteers should be between 20 to 40 age group so we said mm-hmm. young people please come and help us and would you believe mm-hmm. it within a couple of days we had almost 100 volunteers wow Now, wow these are mostly young people who couldn't uh-huh. no longer get to work because of the lockdown who had time on their hands we asked for uh-huh. volunteers who could with their own automobiles uh-huh. like say, motorbike or a car and they came. right so we connect we started a helpline announced it in the media so uh-huh. people who access medicines people who couldn't they had no longer access to food mm-hmm. uh, people did not get their blood checks done those yeah. people stay all in we gave mm-hmm. minimum to the volunteers so that they could handle these things so they mm-hmm. went out and started helping and they were okay. affected situation like mm-hmm. there was this who called my mother has been discharged from hospital i mm-hmm. belong to the next district kollam i am mm-hmm. unable to take her there what do i do mm-hmm. we are we are being uh, discharged from hospital and we mm-hmm. had to set that out get an ambulance get the required permissions from both district authorities and that yeah. can that person go there was his mm-hmm. elderly person now abandoned there was somebody looking yeah. at her. that person was no longer av- available and the yeah. feces and uh, urine and yeah this things needed to be tackled so we reset yeah. our priorities many mm-hmm. other things that we used to handle on home visits are now handled mm-hmm. by patients but actually uh, uh, there is a related question from dr anjanelu who works with sparsh hospice in hyderabad so he was saying uh, in palliative care have you been able to use telemedicine uh, a, a lot because it's is it possible to use telemedicine have you been able to use it uh yes uh what we very recently the medical council of india after mm-hmm. the covid care authorized prescriptions given by telemedicine uh huh so that's new so now that yeah. is a, okay mm-hmm. it's not the law but medical council mm-hmm. of india is a statutory body of the government of india so that goes mm-hmm. but there are limitations say for example uh, that would not satisfy all the requirements for prescribing a control medicine mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you can still decide on the medicine over the uh, on your laptop talking to the person mm-hmm. but still that prescription and the medicine will have to reach the patient in person that's where our volunteers coming me just giving a prescription to the patient will not be enough for control medicines because they cannot access them right yeah will have to go 
so part of the work we are able to do with our mm-hmm. laptop sitting in the office okay okay so um and, and also going back to uh, what you were talking about in covid 19 etc tell us a little bit about there are uh, you know facilitators you've been training you know creating new types of facilitators etc so tell me about the kind of people who need to deal with it on a day to day basis who you are training uh let me the uh, covid is treated in specific hospitals designated mm-hmm. hospitals designated by the government or correct in ail cases it's now advised that they can stay at home whatever the covid treating doctors are from those hospitals mm. now unfortunately why is covid so scary not only really because it kills a lot of people it also causes suffering all of a sudden you are whisked away from your loved ones and you are going to hospital with the thought that i may yeah. never ever get to see them again mm-hmm. no this this pain is a big problem secondly yeah the manifestations of severe covid is they getting pneumonia and being mm. very severely breathless mm. this yeah breathlessness needs to be treated with medicines which our doctors in this country are mostly unfamiliar with including this treatment with low dose morphine mm. third another distressing symptom of covid is restlessness and agitation mm. restlessness of yeah. a degree that you are unable to deal with and you mm-hmm. getting agitated and that mm. can be horrible yeah. for the person to bear horrible even to watch these are yeah. be treated with a certain yeah. kind of sequence of medication which we are familiar with in palliative care so what we mm-hmm. are doing now is giving online training to covid treating doctors mm-hmm. so the course as it is the same now is for 6 days mm-hmm. every day in a week from monday to saturday the doctor yeah. or any healthcare provider spends 75 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes at the session mm. Mm. so these may be busy doctors where they have 100 things to do they come just come in just for 3 o'clock log on their laptops join us mm-hmm. that hope yeah. and over 6 days some essential training is given to them so that they are not only really able to connect the patient to technology and ventilators and things like that they are also yeah. able to treat their pain and breathlessness and agitation correct correct yeah you know one of the things uh, actually uh, nandita was talking to her earlier and she used that's very interesting is emotional band aid you know a lot of work a uh, lot of palliative care a lot of the work is about creating an emotional band aid for the family for the person and all that stuff so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, you know what sort of emotional band aid uh, you we can provide during covid 19 thank you that's a very positive question yes so this person who is plucked away from the family and put in a strange yeah. environment could well feel I mean, where am i no one cares right we could replace the family there but mm. somebody conveying to the person i see mm. you are breathless i care for you i am going to try yeah. to do my god that makes mm-hmm. such an enormous a world of difference for the person mm-hmm. now mm. this this is uh, difficult because the yeah. treating doctor or nurse is protected by uh, protecting uh, equipment they are not visible mm. the ma- only the eyes right. are visible so with your eyes and your voice one has to convey i care for you i am going to try to do the best for you this does not mm. take a day it takes mm. a few months that Correct. that itself is tremendous secondly mm-hmm. the system 
has to have people who will keep in touch with families. Uh, something that may not be happening a lot now, something that needs to happen. You mentioned technology earlier, telemedicine. Right. Here is what I'm saying. For the family to be able to talk to the person mm-hmm. in seconds, that is, can mm-hmm. be so really connecting. Right. But because here we are also worried about a future problem. Yeah. No. social spread of covid is likely to happen there will be lot mm-hmm. of yeah and everybody almost everybody loses a loved one in their lifetime maybe a parent mm-hmm. maybe a grandparent mm-hmm. right painful it hurts for the whole lifetime but you mm-hmm. gradually learn to cope with it and, and right back to life but here mm-hmm. that problem is going to be difficult because the grieving in this case is not normal anything mm-hmm. but it is totally unexpectedly snatching away somebody and a few days being told he is no more and sometimes mm-hmm. not even able uh, being able to see the dead body mm-hmm. yeah Literally, yeah why people are allowed to be at the funeral if that mm-hmm. happen if the person dies in a far away place even that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So we are worried that when mm-hmm. this horror leaves us, it is mm-hmm. going to leave a lot of mental health issues behind. Mm-hmm. Health issues could be left behind. This could be mm-hmm. at least partially salvaged by connecting, yeah. giving some support to the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, he yeah. doesn't do it. He spends only 15 seconds. But yeah. uh, over some time, maybe counsellors, social workers, train mm-hmm. women, all these people mm-hmm. could do it. And this is absolutely necessary. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell me, you know, one of the things I keep thinking about, you know, actually I was talking to some of my friends in Sweden, you know, different parts of the world. And some countries, the way they are treating it is that you will be exposed to this. Okay. you might as well be exposed to covid and get it over with as opposed to being worried about it etc so or you know it is something that we'll all go through and maybe we we'll, everybody who gets it is not going to die so how do we have a mass exposure to it and deal with it so tell me your thought on it i mean is the answer to lock down and keep ourselves safe or is the answer to get a mass exposure or how do we manage this because we can't be in lockdown for the next 10 years so how do we manage this so uh, i'm glad you are asking the question very few people are asking the question uh, you mm-hmm. know our uh, current way of coping seems to be blind optimism maybe everything mm-hmm. will be okay it doesn't happen that way what's likely to no, i'm not a virologist or an epidemiologist but correct no is almost sure to happen is as the lockdown is withdrawn more and more mm-hmm. people get exposed to it most mm-hmm. young people we hope will have very mild symptoms they may mm-hmm. uh, the symptoms of any flu for three days and then they may get mm-hmm. over it mm-hmm. the lockdown i believe was necessary because that we needed time all of a sudden thousands of people getting it all together flooding the hospital mm-hmm. could not right end. the lockdown mm-hmm. ended that week no mm-hmm. it will be more gradual so the young people will get it and more and more young people will get over it and mm-hmm. when they have got over it they will have antibodies in their blood mm-hmm. it is said that when 50% of the population has antibodies in the blood then mm. will have what's called a herd immunity mm. Mm. yeah this is inevitable unless miraculously a vaccine mm-hmm. is available in india mm-hmm. lot of research going on we don't know mm. when have a vaccine 
it's very mm-hmm. likely may take a few few months mm-hmm. when we get the vaccine then mm. there will be a natural conclusion but if not mm-hmm. the natural mm-hmm. conclusion will be with third immunity happening 50% yeah. but there is mm-hmm. a chance this happens it's not going to affect only the youngsters correct or to affect people of my age and if mm-hmm. we already with several diseases get it then mm-hmm. uh, prognosis is very bad therefore mm-hmm. a possible solution is mm-hmm. self quarantine for the elderly All i'm sorry say it again self quarantine self quarantine for the elderly aha uh-huh. yeah elderly. they are uh-huh. not stay, uh, staying at home not uh-huh. getting in contact with the world protecting themselves when uh-huh. the young who go out to work get a mild infection and gradually uh-huh. persistence now the uh-huh. catch is all the young people are not going to be getting only mild disease right self quarantine cannot be effective for all the elderly so some people getting serious illness is inevitable that's mm-hmm. like it. but i believe maybe we have avoided the worst of it but mm-hmm. there is time lag coming in and we have mm-hmm. more people getting the infection therefore whatever we mentioned earlier the treatment including palliative care is widely mm-hmm. now and for the immediate future mm-hmm. Yeah I want to say hi to Manvendra who joined his uh, quarantine himself in Jaisalmer and uh, with a bunch of people but anyway it's great to see some uh, people uh, I I just want to continue on the last thing you talked about which is palliative care for managing covid you know because part of it is uh, you know palliative care as we talked about earlier is about how to live with symptoms how to handle the symptoms and not just uh, you know be ready to die but how to handle the symptoms so tell me a little bit about how can we apply palliative care to handling uh, covid to handling it as a symptom handling it as a community how do we work better to have this herd immunity uh, so two aspects to it the herd immunity Uh, is by when the lockdown is over it's something that will happen automatically when several mm-hmm. people get the uh, symptoms but uh, in the course as we said some people will get disease and some of them can be serious now mm-hmm. uh, and what how is palliative care exactly that okay let me put it another way if i am to get it what mm-hmm. would i like i certainly want the covid treating doctor there and the covid treating nurse they have the expertise but i also pick a couple of things i would like to be treated as a person mm-hmm. people would be talking to me and with uh, talking to me and looking at me with compassion mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. rather than saying hey, you are being a danger to the whole person come on let me i am going to put you in isolation if somebody say yeah see that uh, you may not enjoy being a separate from the family but we are going to take care for you thereafter when i say pain i hope no one will say it doesn't matter it matters to me mm. right i hope i yeah. get appropriate treatment which the average doctor in this country has not been trained in because only mm-hmm. from 19 that got into the medical curriculum correct correct yeah so i want to we need to wrap up so i just want to say that it's been really great to meet you and one of the things uh, nandita told me you always talk about is that an average doctor is trained only one hour in palliative care as an elective you know and it's uh, coming more into it so i think as doctors as human beings as all of us i think we need to learn more about palliative care and see it's not just about destroying the disease it's not just about uh, you know uh, preparing for death it's really about living with a certain condition 
how do you manage the pain how do you live with it and how do you have uh, the best possible life while handling a situation so thank you for all the wonderful work uh, you're doing in trivandrum and we hope to uh, you know get to know you better in the future thank you so much for your time dr okay thank you thank you everybody and, uh, and uh, uh, and i want big thanks to nandita for introducing us to dr rajgopal bye bye